Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, welcome, my father, Mitch Paco. Welcome to Threshold of Hope. And usually we deal with uh, just going through documents, but we are getting a backlog of questions again. And so, uh, plus we've got some folks here in the studio audience that have some of their own questions. <clears throat> so we're going to do a mailbag show today. And with some of these questions, I'll be talking more about scripture. And this is just a good way for me to introduce that when we finish the present encyclical on ecumenism, we plan to start doing Bible studies during this program. So I'll start doing some Bible studies. Uh, it'll be uh, early next year that we do that. Uh, just, we'll just finish up the encyclical on ecumenism and then go into that. So let's, let's start off with a question from the studio audience before I go to these emails. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Minnesota. Minnesota, what part? Andover. It's north of Minneapolis, about north 20 of Minneapolis. miles. Sure, sure, I know that area. I used to teach over in St. Anthony Township. Oh, okay. uh, it's a nice, beautiful area. Yeah. And you're a little chilly. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> but what's your question? Well, today when we go to funerals, people seem to just, Catholics, you know, I guess of every religion, but Catholics in particular are always like, well, you know, they, they passed away, they were a good person, and they're in heaven, you know, they're just, they're in heaven. I'm like, well, I'm a convert to the Catholic Church, and I've been reading a lot about purgatory and studying about purgatory, mm -hmm. and I think people forget that purgatory is important. Yeah. And that we need to really remember that's a true doctrine of the church. Ex exactly. It's not, um, you know, a private opinion. It is a dogma of the church. And I, I know I, I've been somewhat concerned for a number of years. And some of my priest friends are concerned as well that sometimes the funeral masses are more like canonization procedures, you know? And now I, I don't want to speak ill of the dead when I'm doing a sermon. I'm not gonna go through all their bad stuff. When I do funerals, I uh, talk somewhat about the nice stuff that they may have done, but I actually try to focus more on what Jesus Christ does for our salvation then I focus on what I may have done or the other person, obviously I don't speak at my own funeral. I won't be speaking at my own funeral. I'll have, I plan to give them the hymns I want them to sing and the readings, but other than that, they're on their own. <laughs> and I, uh, but when I preach at, at funerals, um, I'm more concerned with the folks who are there to exhort them to goodness and holiness so that they get to heaven and for us to pray for the person who has died. Uh, so much so that when my last great aunt died a few years ago, I did the funeral. I, went, I was able to be up uh, in Chicago for, at the old church that my great, great grandparents helped build. They came from Poland with my great grandmother who was born in Poland too and they built that church, St. Florian's. And so it was, uh, she was the last of that generation, and her sweet, sweet aunt, I loved her very, very much. And um, uh, I, I finished up the sermon, and we buried her, and had a lunch, and one of my older cousins came up to me and says, uh, don't you think that sermon was kind of long? And I said, well, Mike, I was looking out at, you couldn't see the congregation. I was looking out at y'all. And as I looked, I said, oh, that one needs another two minutes. That one over there could use another minute. And when I saw you, I said, five more minutes for Mike. <laughs> <laughs> but the concern is for the, you know, for the people there to experience, because some of them don't darken the church doors too often otherwise. And to focus on how, if you communicate, well, this person is all in heaven and all that. And meanwhile, they go back to the lunch and tell all the nasty stories about them. Uh, 
it can encourage people to be a little negligent of their own moral problems. And I think that this is something that all of us have to uh, continue to work on. And praying for the dead, especially, you know, this is, you know, in November, you know, we, the, the whole month is, is a month that we dedicate to praying for the souls of the departed and do so otherwise as well. That's a very, very good and holy thing, as the Bible says. In 2 Maccabees, it is a good and holy thing to pray for the dead. So that's what we do. And Mother Angelica said that. Don't you go around thinking that I'm in heaven. You pray for my soul that I get out of purgatory. That was her strict orders. And I'm not the one to ever want to contradict her. All right, we have an email here. Father, I'm an 82-year-old United Methodist minister. My wife and I watch EWTN every day on DISH. We're very interested in joining the Catholic Church. However, we have some questions. Good, we like questions. I notice that in the daily celebration of the Mass on EWTN, the parishioners do not receive the blood of Christ, but only the body. Why? And second, if my wife and I become Catholic, can we receive the Eucharist even though we both had prior marriage? Paul in Ohio. Well, Reverend Paul, um, for your first question, it's an option in the Catholic liturgy. The Catholic liturgy has a number of options, one of which is to offer both the body and blood of Christ to everybody, or some, in some cases, only the body of Christ. The reason that we can have uh, either one is that we, in our language, we believe that it's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. But we don't speak of it as specifically a physical presence. It's his body, but we don't use the word physical, and here's why. If there was a heresy that tried to do that. And then people began to say, oh, is this host part of the earlobe? Or is this from a finger? And hey, Exactly, your reaction is exactly right. So that's a weird thing to think about. But people think weird thoughts. It's okay, it's not, it, it happens all the time. And, and the church said, no, 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 no. When you receive the Eucharist, if you receive only a particle of a host, you receive the whole of Christ. If you receive only the body of Christ and not the precious blood, you still receive the whole person of Christ, not a part of him. And that's why that's important. You know, they, um, it's, but the church allows us to uh, have uh, both. Uh, but it's not required. It's not required. And, uh, and, and that's theologically why. As a matter of fact, I met a priest who had been a prisoner in a Chinese concentration camp. Under the, he was captured by the communists in China. And he, um, his mother, was eventually able to send him a care package you know, a little box with some things. One of the, two of the items in there were packages of Neko candy. Now, I don't know if they still make that. Do they? Do they? Yeah. Some, some of you may have Neko. They're like, look at the little chocolate wafers, light chocolate um, wafers, but they're sugary, not chocolatey. And in between each one, she put a host. That's how she smuggled hosts into him. And then she sent a bottle of medicine, which was wine. And he was able to celebrate Mass once a week in secret in his cell. And, you know, preserving those hosts. And there were a number of other priests in the camp. So he would celebrate Mass and then break the host in as many tiny little particles so that every priest could have a particle of the host. And, you know, they all received 
the entirety of Jesus Christ. He had to use the cap of the bottle for a chalice. That's all he had. But I suspect that was one of the most precious chalices anywhere in the world. Now, he, he eventually was brought back out. That's how we know about it, because he was given in a prisoner exchange program. And I met him uh, back in the early 90s. Um, he had actually been healed of a disease, miraculous uh, lung disease, by now Saint Claude de la Colombière. Uh, uh, and it was his miracle that made Claude de la Colombière a saint. He'd been a blessed, and that was the one that uh, did it. But, you know, those tiny particles were enough to receive the entirety of Jesus Christ. And, again, that's why you can have the body and or the blood of Christ. Some people, by the way, can only receive the precious blood. I've known people who have cancer and they can't swallow even a particle of the host because of the cancer in their throat. So I would give them just a little drop of the precious blood and they still receive the whole Christ. Okay, So that, that's something that can be done. Now as far as your previous marriages, I'd want you to do, uh, Reverend Paul, is go and speak to a local Catholic priest. I don't know the circumstances uh, involved there, whether the original spouses are still alive, whether you, don't, you didn't clarify if they had died and you're remarried, or whatever, I don't know. So go talk to a local Catholic pastor and see where, where that can go, okay? Um, but you'd be very, very welcome. You're welcome to the church. Then we have an email from John. This one is also somewhat, a little bit more complicated than uh, a lot of the emails. That's why I wanted to do this and deal with a biblical issue here. Father Pacwa, St. Paul seems to be getting little respect anymore within the church. What is he, Rodney Dangerfield's protege? <laughs> I was talking with a parish priest and I quoted St. Paul on the roles in marriage, and I was stunned when the priest's response was, well, St. Paul was so long ago. Well, that's not good logic. So was Jesus Christ. <laughs> Moses was 1,200 years before that. I mean, what are you thinking? I, I digress. That effectively ended the conversation. Huh, ageism. So our deacon gave a homily some time ago wherein he bluntly stated that St. Paul's directive for wives to obey their husbands was only meant for St. Paul's culture and time period. Women I know also argue that St. Paul's teachings were only for his time period as if the church teaching has evolved since then with regard to faith and morals. On top of all this, one of the texts we were asked to use as catechists says many of the letters of St. Paul were likely written by ghost writers or disciples. All this seems to undermine traditional church teaching and Pauline theology. If St. Paul's letters are considered inspired, then how would the world as a layperson supposed, how in the world is a layperson supposed to deal with all this? John. John, you're right. Uh, no wonder you're confused. Let's, <laughs> let's take a look at some of these issues, all right? First of all, the text that you mentioned that you use in catechism, which states that St. Paul had writers, secretaries, not ghost writers. They, uh, uh, they weren't ghosts, they were fully alive, but they were called uh, secretaries, amenuenses. Uh, that's the word in Greek for them. And in fact, we see uh, that mentioned uh, in, um, uh, let's see, in Romans, in which the amanuensis, the secretary who wrote that down, also gives his greeting. Uh, let's see. 
Oh, here it is in chapter in Romans chapter 16, verse 22. It says, I, Tertius, the writer of this letter, greet you in the Lord. So he's the, the, the secretary who actually did the writing as St. Paul dictated, gives his name and says, oh, hello. You know, he's, it's, it's not any kind of a secret. And we also see that in some of his letters, St. Paul says, uh, you, uh, like, I uh, believe in Galatians. In Galatians, it mentions um, that um, uh, I put, I sign this myself. You know, with my own penmanship, so you can recognize it. Somebody else wrote it, he signed it. And then when you get to First and Second Timothy and Titus, you notice that the vocabulary in those three letters is closely related, but is very different from St. Paul's normal vocabulary. There are 74 words that never occur in any other letters by St. Paul, but they do occur in those three letters only. Now, one of the things that you then take a little bit more of a look at things and you look carefully, and what do you discover? A, he mentions, everybody's abandoned me except Luke. He mentions how Luke is still with him. Second point that we notice, those 74 distinctive words are used with a certain amount of frequency in the Gospel of Luke and in his other book, Acts of the Apostles. So he mentions that Luke is with him, and then this distinctive vocabulary in those three letters is typical of St. Luke, because Luke was most likely his secretary for those. Say, and you have to keep this in mind. Did they have Xerox machines? No. How did they, quote, publish things? The typical way to publish books in the ancient world was to have one person speaking a word and a number of other people writing it down at the same time. That's how they published. So uh, in, let me write down the word in, the beginning, and you might have 10 guys writing that down. And then you have to check afterwards to make sure what they wrote each time is correct. But that's how they would publish letters and get multiple copies out. That was typical. So I go through that to show that, A, there were other people who were actually his secretaries but that doesn't mean he's not the author of the letter. He's the one who's dictating it to the secretaries. And that's typical of ancient writing. Okay, that's just the way all published works were done. Uh, you see, for instance, later on, uh, uh, Eusebius of Caesarea, who wrote his church history, mentions how after the Diocletian persecutions, the Emperor Constantine commissioned royal secretaries to make 50 copies of the Bible because the Roman government had been destroying the copies of the Bible wherever they could, so they got copies, and he pay, said the government has to pay back what they destroyed. So they made copies. Where, where on, on vellum, which is um, on animal skins, so that that's extremely expensive. Those, those kinds of Bibles could cost, up in our money, about $500,000 each. They were extremely expensive because a different animal skin for each page. 
plus the guys to write it and tanning it and all that stuff. So it was very, very tedious work. But that's how they did it. Papyrus was a cheap way to publish, but it decays quickly. Vellum lasts for centuries. We still have a number of entire Bibles from that time of Constantine when Christianity was legalized that were written on the, that leather. You know, the Codex Vaticanus, Codex Alexandrinus, Codex Sinaiticus, these are all fourth century, the 300s. So that's, that's what they did, multiple copies. Now, as one of the other things, let's take a look at that passage in Ephesians. You know, about uh, uh, as either you or the deacon, um, you know, misquote what St. Paul says. Uh, St. Paul's directive for wives to obey their husbands was only meant for St. Paul's culture. No, it's not. Now, but you have to understand what it actually says. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. That, being subject to one another out of reverence for Christ, is an order given to all the Christians. He goes first, wise, to your own husbands. Now that, see, that's the other thing too. There are a couple different words for your in husband, you know, in, in these cases. And they usually just translate this to your husband. That would be toisendrasen humon in Greek. But that's not what it says. It says tois idios andrasen which means to your own husbands as distinct as somebody else's. That's the concern. And this is written a couple thousand years before Fifty Shades of Grey. This is something where you are to be faithful to your own spouse. That's the issue. As opposed to messing around with somebody else. Because unlike the Holy Land, where marriage was much more stable, in the Greek and Roman world, adultery was very common. Now, you could still get into big trouble with your spouse if you committed adultery. And sometimes that happened. But if you doubt me, read um, the um, Twelve Caesars by Suetonius, the Roman historian. You can get that in paperback. Uh, and you see how one of the empresses had a contest with how many men she could be with in one night. Now, uh, now this was a shame for her, for her husband, and all this. this kind, and these are the stories that the Romans are telling about their own political leaders. And so this, uh, that's what's going on there. Is it irrelevant today to tell a spouse, a wife in this case, to be faithful to your own husband in distinction to somebody else? Has that changed all of a sudden that it's okay to be unfaithful to your spouse? I don't think that's changed one bit. But you have to read the text as it's written and not just sort of, uh, interpret it through uh, politically correct eyes. And then he goes on, but then he also says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of, of, of water with the word. Now, how did Christ love the church? Did he sit enthroned on an easy chair? It's one of my favorite things. Well, I, I get this reading a lot at weddings, right? And when I'm preaching at weddings, I love this text 
because I like to also remind the men. It doesn't say that Christ loved his church by sitting on an easy chair watching the television and f clicking the channels. He loved the church by being enthroned on a cross. And that therefore, if you love your wife as Christ loved the church, you are willing to lay down your life on the cross. Has that changed? That people need to die to themselves in order to be good spouses. And as far as headship in the family, you know, uh, individual spouses have their own distinctive gifts. There are, I, I met one man, a young man who was engaged, and I watched him um, do just absolutely dumb things that cost a lot of money because he was just spacey. Not, he wasn't a spendthrift, he was a space cadet. And when I met his fiancée, I said, you are going to be the one in charge of the money, are you not? Because he's an idiot. <laughs> he can't handle it. And he said, don't worry, I got that covered. I said, good. You know, and there was, you know, a, a couple works out their own distinctive gifts with each other. There are lots of families where the husband is a far better cook than the wife, and he does the cooking. And they're both comfortable with that. I just met a couple the other day. Yeah, I do all the cooking, but she does the laundry. You know, that, you work out various ways of your own skills and abilities so that you live. The, it's not saying wives got to do all the cooking, cleaning, and dishes. No. Husbands and wives work these things out. And sometimes uh, it, it is necessary for one spouse usually the husband, but not always, you know, by any means, to go out of the home to work. And then the house tasks have to be up to the other spouse. Uh, you know, that I know plenty of couples. Sometimes we both are professionals, but it's the wife who goes out and does the, the work in the outside world, and the husband, does. It, it varies. And that doesn't take away from this, that... Be submissive to your own husband, and husbands, lay down your lives for your wife like Christ lays it down for the church so that you can sanctify her. And that is the goal of matrimony, that you, as a spouse, help each other get to heaven. That's your number one goal, not to win the arguments. I don't see here it says husband's got to win the argument every time. That's not there. And he's not going to. <laughs> That's not the way that it works. And, you know, it's rather how do we as a couple help each other get to heaven and not go to hell? And how do we help our children get to heaven and not go to hell? That's the basics. That's the, and there are, there are going to be adaptations of St. Paul's teaching to different cultures and different times. But the principles that he's stating here are not irrelevant. And I urge the parish priest and the parish deacon and the catechist and everybody else to learn a little bit more Greek learn a little bit more scripture, and be a lot more careful about flippant attitudes towards St. Paul just because they sound politically correct, when in fact, textually, they don't make good sense, and they miss the a point that remains absolutely relevant as the Word of God for our culture, without denying the reality of individual couples and the way that they figure out how to live as a family. And that's not just modern, believe me. I have no doubt that ancient women had their own ways, just like the modern women do today. That hasn't changed.
All right, we're going to take a little break. A uh, little break. We'll come back in a couple minutes. Get some more questions from our studio audience as well as uh, some more of your emails. So please stay with us. <laughs> Uh, another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Uh, Orange County, New York. Orange County, New York. And your question? We've been to many weddings, and, and uh, the passage from St. Paul is read at many, many of them. And it seems like a lot of people bristle when he says, women, be submissive to your husbands. Mm -hmm. and. My question is, why isn't it explained like you explained it? And it would make it so much smoother. Well, here, one of the first things I, is the way that it's in the lectionary. Why be submissive to your husbands? Instead of starting off with the verse, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Start off with the whole text. You, if you take a text out of its context, you run into problems. Take a look at it in its context. Be subject to one another. Husbands to, to your wives in, in your way, wives to your husbands, children obey your, ch your, your parents. It, it goes on. Everybody has to be subject instead of pushing themselves around and say, get out of my way, varmint. You know, the, you know, we are not using Yosemite Sam as a model for how we live in community. You know, so that's, that's one of the first things. Deal with the, the, that context. It's only another verse. Put it that way. And then it doesn't, you know, screech against our sensitivities. And then, again, pay attention. When it says that husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, well, then you have to think about how, what, what a wonderful image that is. Christ loves his church like a husband loves his wife. That's an imagery that goes back to the Old Testament. And, you know, where Israel um, loves uh, the, the, uh, the Lord like a wife, and the Lord loves the Israel like a groom. And now it's applied between Christ and the church. It goes back to Hosea in the uh, 740s uh, or 30s uh, BC. And then Jeremiah in the early 500s BC. And Ezekiel at the same time as uh, 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 Jeremiah. So, but you then have to ask. What did Jesus do to love his church? He died for her. That's what husbands need to learn. Now, this isn't about, you know, me just coming home from work and being able to sit back, you know, because that's, that's not real life. You know, it's uh, a husband, you know, there's time for rest, you know, but also a key element of marriage is learning to adapt to the ver varieties between uh, 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 behavior between humans, uh, between women and men. You know, um, uh, one of my uh, favorite little stats is that the average man speaks about 12,000 words a day. The average woman speaks about 26,000. So by the time a guy gets home from work, he's about done. A wife is halfway there. <laughs> and what, does that mean that one is worse than the other? No. Both need to learn from that difference, the complementary aspect of that difference. There's times where a guy has to be quiet. There's times you have to learn each other's language. 
when, uh, and I warn, I always warn young men when I'm getting them ready for marriage. When your wife says to you, I don't want to talk about it. Don't pick up and walk away. Because she doesn't mean she doesn't want to talk about it. That's not what she's saying. She means, I want you to be quiet, and I'm doing the talking now. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? And that's what, whereas when a guy says, I don't want to talk about it, he's either going to start crying, or he's so angry, or he's ready to punch a hole in the wall or whatever, and he really doesn't want to talk about it. And it's two different, the same words, Two different experiences of how you live those words. And part of marriage is learning how to deal with those distinctive aspects that complement and help each other grow. Women help men to deal with a certain amount of uh, learning to listen and put into words what's going on inside. While men, you know, are tend to be better in a, in a hunting deer stand because we are more quiet. <laughs> Plus, we don't wear any makeup that has a smell to it. <laughs> but it's, you know, this is something that, you know, that, that complementariness, uh, you know, in raising kids as well as in loving each other. You know, dads, it's, it's amazing how it's, it's I th it's some sort of an instinct. But dads take their babies and just start tossing them in the air. And women <laughs> panic and you say, no, I'll, I'll catch them. You know, uh, women give that sense of security. Men teach them risk. And, and risk is fun, uh, except for mom. <laughs> but it's, but there, am I right? I mean, it's much more likely <coughs> that dad will wrestle with the kids on the floor. Mom is more likely to just sit and talk. It's these complement each other. And these are the things that families learn. And the older people are, the more, longer they're married, they begin to realize, I don't know why he is that way. I don't know why she does what she does, but I love her. As a matter of fact, most guys will say, I'd be dead without her. You know, so that's just the way it is. Ma'am, you have another question? Uh, yes, really on the same topic. Uh, you've just talked about all the intricacies and the time involved in being in a marriage, man and woman. Um, in today's world, and really mostly from Catholics, I'm hearing a lot of comments priests should be married. Yeah. And I can't even begin to imagine that. I wonder yeah. if you would address that, please. Yeah, sure. You know, it's, um, I, I've often said, I would love to be married. I would love to have kids. I would hate to be my wife or my kids. Because <laughs> knowing me, I would neglect them. I know I would for the, for the church. That's just the way I would be. And it's not fair to them. You know, it's not fair. Uh, God in his mercy has <laughs> saved some poor woman <laughs> from having to put up with me. But it's, it's, it's something that on one hand, the practical elements of marriage are, are a great strain. And I think this is the one of the worst times to start thinking about introducing married clergy. Marriage is enough of a crisis. It's not as if we can say, oh yeah, marriage is such a good life and there's so much cultural support and everything goes great for married couples. This is one of the worst times to start that. And you know, uh, uh, marriage isn't stable enough to begin that kind of thing. And to add the instability of the clergy, you know, we, we've certainly seen a number of the Protestant ministers who became Catholic priests already have experienced divorce. You know, it's not easy for them, uh, for their wives and children. It's hard. Uh, among Protestant ministers, I remember when I was at Vanderbilt, they had brought this up, 
uh, I was, you know, it's, a, it's also a, a graduate school and a seminary. And the seminarians talked about this, uh, and the faculty did, that Protestant ministers have the highest divorce rate of a profession. Now, they're neck and neck with police and um, uh, what do you call it, the uh, uh, guards at prisons, prison guards. Prison guards, police, and Protestant ministers have about the same divorce rate. And it's the highest of professionals, not among non-professionals. Non-professionals have a higher divorce rate, uh, working class and stuff. But the um, uh, ministers have, because of the strain on the family that, 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 that comes from the commitment to the church. And yeah, you see in practical things. A uh, Methodist minister friend of mine uh, was telling me he didn't know what to do one night. His wife had gone off for girls' night out with her friends, and he's taking care of the baby. But then he got a call to go to the hospital because someone was dying, and he couldn't bring the baby in the hospital. It wasn't allowed. So then what is he doing? He has no one to give him to. You know, he was a country pastor. So uh, it, it's... These are the kinds of strains that make it difficult. And special. I mean, everybody has difficulties, but that's some of the practical stuff. Not to mention, and if Catholic laity would like to see Catholic priests get married, you better plan on paying us about four or five times more than what we're getting now. How, how would you support a wife and kids? And if there's multiple priests in the parish, you're not going to have one or two families living in the same rectory. You know, so you have to have a housing expense and all that. This is, this is not easy. And then that's just the practical stuff on a spiritual level. A priest... As the Vatican Council mentions six different times in various documents of Vatican II, that the priest acts in persona Christi, that is, in the person of Christ. This is an expression that comes from St. Paul, 2 Corinthians, which, by the way, is still relevant, that it were, where he says that he himself acts in to prosopo Christu, in the person of Christ. If Christ is the bridegroom of the church, then I too must act as a bridegroom of the church. I have to love the church as a man loves his bride. And as anybody knows who's been to a wedding, the groom is not the center of attention. It's the bride. She's the one in the pretty dress. And she's the one who gets the attention. And he's, he's there. And that's a proper thing. Because, you know, in, uh, with the priesthood, the attention is not to be on us. It's on the church. And our lives are to be centered on the church. And as Christ loved the church and laid down his life for the church, so must we priests do. If I were married, then I'd have two brides in a sense. And again, knowing me, knowing me, I would let the woman I was married to sort of be second fiddle to the church. I, would just, I, I just know I would do that. Now, she might call me away from that. And there, I remember there, there, in the Eastern churches, there are married clergy. And they have a tradition of this, where for centuries they've had parish priests who were married. But I remember talking to a Melkite priest in Nazareth one time. And <laughs> as we're carrying on a conversation, it was very interesting, all of a sudden the shutters open up, and she yells, it's time for dinner, yalla, you know, so, so he had to go, so, sorry, I got to go, <laughs> you know, that, so he did, uh, which is, I understand, but it, I know I would neglect it, you know, so a, a woman and my kids, so. ma'am, you have another question?
comment on that too about priests being married. Our society seems to think, you know, fast food mentality. We have a shortage of priests. They should just all get married now. Yeah. Forgetting this is a calling from God. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're supposed to be really in discerning marriage and discerning priesthood. Exactly. And we're forgetting about the whole discernment period. Yep. Yep. And we just don't rush into these matters. And we have a priest up in northern Wisconsin that's taking care of three busy parishes. If he was married, he'd have burnout before he's 35. Or our other priest friend of ours in the Legion of Mary is taking care of five parishes in southern Minnesota. So you can't do both. Right. without getting burnt out totally. So it, uh, it's not going to help the church overall to just it, have that that as the answer. Exactly. It, you're, you're right. And, and here's, well, some people say, yeah, but if you had married clergy, you'd have more of them so they wouldn't have to have five parishes or three parishes. The reality is, among the Protestant denominations, they also do not have enough men for, or women, some of them ordained women too, but they don't have enough ministers for their churches, even though they're married and they have women clergy. They still don't have enough because it's a challenge and uh, they have a high rate of clergy leaving the ministry in their 40s. Why? That's when their kids are starting to go to college and they can't afford it on a minister's wages. So they have to quit and get another job so they can send their kids to college. See, that's, those are realities that are, are challenges. Some ministers do fine. Some really struggle. So it's, um, these are some of the things that we have to deal with. Well, well thank you for your comments and questions. Let's take another email here from Frank in Hartford, Connecticut. Dear Father Mitch, I've seen a number of Episcopal churches and a few Catholic churches that conduct blessing of animals services. Many link this uh, to St. Francis of Assisi in some way. What is the church's teaching on blessing animals? Well, there are a couple things. Now, um, I, myself, have a couple pet cats, and I like my cats very much. Um, you know, they were both feral cats born in the woods, and I domesticated them. And I, I, and I love them to be cats. You know, they're, I don't, they're not dogs, they're not pet mice. Matter of fact, one of them, I was doing a radio interview, <laughs> and the, the Tom brought in a chipmunk, a live chipmunk, and let him go in my office while I'm trying to do an international radio interview. <laughs> and I kept telling him, you can't have pets, you are the pet. <laughs> uh, and he was chasing the chipmunk around my office. Um, and and they're, they're a blessing, they're, they're good for us. You know, for humans to have uh, animals as pets uh, does us some good, you know. And it, it's not bad for the animals either. You know, they, um, they, they do better. But, uh, and we can bless them like we would various other things around us. For instance, um, I bless trucks, cars, tractors, boats. Why? Because we want to ask God's protection on the vehicles that we're in, not only for our sake, but also for the um, other people on the road, right? That's, or if you're a farmer and you bless a tractor, you know, you want that blessed and other farming implements and other tools, etc., because you want safety for yourself and for other people and to do well. So you can also bless the animals, just so long as you don't think that they're Catholic when they do. <laughs> They're, they're not. It's not a baptism, you know. No, no, no. It's a blessing, um, and you want them protected. You want them protected from diseases. You know, critters get diseases of different kinds, and you want them to be safe. They have a lot of enemies. You know, they there there are uh, hawks and owls that would try to take them and eat them. So you know, the animal world is not a nice place. 
you know, that it's not, it's not a Disney cartoon out there. You know, um, believe me, I, I'm out in the woods plenty, and the animals don't like each other. <laughs> Some of them get along. But, uh, you know, with my two cats, they're brother and sister, they're litter mates, so they've been together their whole lives. But even they get into it now and again, you know. So, uh, you know, this is something that, um, you know, you pray for them to be safe and that, and that they do their job. It's great to let them follow their instincts. See, that's what you do, let them be their instincts. And for which reason, I'm delighted. I no longer have moles in my yard. They follow their instincts. What were some of Mother Angelica's biggest ecumenical hurdles in establishing EWTN? Starting a Catholic monastery in the South in the 1960s was not a cakewalk, I know. How did she deal with the anti-Catholicism and in spite of everything, gain so much ecumenical support? Lisa in Philadelphia. First, you know, I, she did have trouble um, a number of times. Uh, apparently, Ku Klux Klansmen uh, drove by and shot up the convent a little bit. You know, they fire off some shotguns at the convent door. Um, you know, and just a little bit of a warning. But Mother dealt with that as any Christian ought to. She didn't hate. She loved. And she, when she was invited to go to other people's churches and synagogues, she would go and explain, for instance, once she was about to uh, start what a convent is, what do we do, and she would give talk, and then she would do Bible studies. And, you know, Catholics at the time, I don't even think were 2% of the state of Alabama. It's a very small Catholic population. Now we're bigger, but you know, it's only about four or five percent. Um, and she would have Bible studies and non-Catholic people would come and she was delighted to be with them. And when, when she spoke at a local synagogue, she bragged how after when she had her surgeries, remember she had the brace and all that, she said, I looked at the blood donors, and all three were Jewish. And they loved it, you know, she loved that. She said she was grateful that Jewish people donated blood and I benefited, so God bless us all. Um, that, that was her attitude. And this is a, a very good thing, you know, to, to have that sense that we're talking about in this encyclical. Where are the bridges? Where are the commonalities? And how do we bridge that? Even when somebody was hateful, like, Shooting a shotgun at your door is a hateful act, but she didn't let that stop her. And then Father Pacwa, my father died recently and I was wondering if there was any teaching in, from the church as to whether or not souls in heaven can see what's going on with their loved ones on earth. Jeff in Tennessee. Yes, there is, Jeff. If you look in the book of Revelation chapter 6, you see that the martyrs are perfectly aware of what's going on on earth. And they asked Christ about the suffering of the martyrs still on earth. In their case, when will you avenge their blood, you know, and, and get this to stop? So they're well aware. So yeah, they're aware. So behave. Your father still is watching you. I, and I, st my mom is watching me. I still eat all my vegetables. I always ate my vegetables. That was good. And uh, let's see, uh, just on one other thing, on Easter, uh, from Ray in West Texas, on Easter Sunday Mass, when one renews its baptism, are all of our sins forgiven as we, as first or baptized? No, you need to go to confession. You know, you're old enough to, to confess your sins, so go to confession. But do renew your uh, baptismal vows and make that commitment. And on the Feast of Christ the King, renew your consecration to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. We do well to renew these commitments, just like married couples renew their commitments to each other when they celebrate anniversaries and such. So do we have a couple celebrating 41 years of marriage to each other. It's a good thing. All right, we have run out of time. Out of time, I've committed to the clock. So may the Lord bless you and keep you, the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. And again, remember that this network is brought to you by you. You make it possible with your generous donations all these many years. So keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we will pay our bills too. Thank you.